One of my favorite stories of Christian faith comes from the Christian writer, theologian, and nonviolent activist, Walter Wink. If that name, Walter Wink, sounds familiar to you, hopefully it does, because we studied his book this past fall with Harold in our 9.30 a.m. class. The story I'm telling, though, comes from an earlier book of his, and it's about two Christian peacemakers he knew who were working in Europe after World War II. Their names were Hildegard and John Gosmeyer. Hildegard and John had a strong relationship with a group of Christians in Poland. And so about 10 years after the war, they went to visit these close friends of them. As they came, everyone greeted each other, gave big hugs, connected, shared what was new, broke bread. And then after a few hours, John and Hildegard had to share that they had another motive for coming this time more than just saying hello. They had to ask this group a question, a big question and a hard question. They asked this group of Polish Christians, would you be willing to meet with Christians from West Germany? Remember, this is only 10 years after World War II and the Holocaust. These Christians want to ask forgiveness for what Germany did to Poland during the war and to begin to build a new relationship. As Jean and Hildegard asked this question, they were hoping for a quick yes, but instead, it was just stone cold silence back. No one would speak. Everyone was kind of shuffling their feet, looking at one another, till finally the leader of this group of Polish Christians spoke up. And he said as nicely, but as firmly as he could to this couple, John and Hildegard, we love you too. You are our friends. But what you're asking is absolutely impossible. We're here in Warsaw, Poland, and each stone of our city, each stone of Warsaw is soaked in Polish blood because of Christians from Germany. We can't forgive that. That is too much. It's impossible. Hildegard and John heard that word, heard those words and understood them. They probably hoped to maybe come back in six months or a year or try again. And they stayed for a few more hours, had dinner, and then right before they were going to leave for the evening, they gathered together with the Polish Christians for a, a time of prayer. And as they closed for prayer that evening, they, they closed with the way we often close prayer here, with the Lord's Prayer. Together, they all joined in praying, Our Father, who art in heaven. They continued on with the prayer, continuing on until they got to the words, Forgive us our sins as we forgive dot, dot, dot. It was a long silence that interrupted that prayer. Everyone stopped. And again, they weren't sure how to continue on, what to do, until finally the leader, the same one who'd spoken up so, so, so nicely but firmly earlier, spoke up again. And he said, Hildegard and John, yes, I must say yes to you. I could no more pray that our Father, I could no longer call myself a Christian if I refuse to forgive. Humanly speaking, I don't know how I will do it. I can't. It's too big for me. But God will give us the strength. A year later, those Polish Christians met with the group of German Christians asking to meet with them. They met in in Austria. They heard each other's stories. They confessed their sins. They were honest with each other. And they offered forgiveness. And then they continued to meet. And pray and be friends, not just for a year or two years, but for decades and decades for the rest of their lives together. I love that story. I find that story deeply encouraging, especially as I look at the world today. And it really as the world as it, as it kind of always reverts to our world that's so full of deep divisions, that's so full of different boxes, that's so full of you have done hurt to me, so I will do hurt back to you. 
especially today, I think about how much of our world is about competing against or defeating or keeping away those who are different from us, those we consider our enemies. How much of the time do we think those who maybe are, have different views or maybe have done wrong to us, that we just need to stay away from them or that we just need to do what they did back to us? How much of the time do we think that there's two ways to be in the world? There's either to be the victims and to have hurt or pain done to you and do nothing about it, or the second way is to pay back that harm, the same or even more so back. And that to be the, that's our view of victory. That's our view of success. And so often our world tells us it's just those two ways to be the, either be the victim or to seek vengeance. And what Christ is offering today, what Christ is inviting us into today is a third way. A third way of grace, a third way of love, a third way of reconciliation. I find this story so encouraging because it, it leads us to that third way. I also find it encouraging because of the strength it must have taken. I find it encouraging when I consider my own doubts, as we all have doubts. Doubts about our strength as people, doubts about faith and who we can be and doubts about what we can actually do as followers of Christ. So much of the time we may hear Christ's words and make them maybe think they sound nice, but we doubt that we can truly live them out. We doubt that we are truly strong enough. And that's especially true when we turn to these words from Jesus we find today in the Gospel of Luke. The words Jesus has for us today seem to be so big, so daunting, so impossible. And we may just say, should I even try? Things like love your enemies, bless those who persecute you, do not judge, give not just your outer coat, but your inner shirt too. Lend, expecting nothing back in return. No bank is going to survive very long with that practice. Forgive. Forgive even your enemies. Forgive even those who have hurt you. These are not easy commands. They're not easy for any one of us. They are difficult and challenging. And they are so difficult and challenging that many of us would probably like to respond to these words of Jesus similar way as that Polish Christian 60 years ago, saying back to Jesus, Jesus, what you are asking is impossible. We might think they sound like nice sounding words, but more pie in the sky hopeful that, well, that's good sentiment, Jesus. That's the right thinking, but that's not really something we can do in the real world. As if Jesus didn't know the real world, as if he didn't spend every day walking dusty roads, being with those who are poor and hungry, knowing real suffering, real pain, even going himself to the cross for our sake. Sometimes think of Jesus as this person who didn't know real life, but Jesus knew it to the fullest. He knew human touch and love and relationships and care and stories. He knew the real world when he was saying these words. But we might still think, Jesus, love your enemies, really? Pray for those who hurt us? We're not really expected to live that way, right? We can maybe try a little bit. Maybe if someone does a small, small slight, maybe sometime way down the future. I can forgive them and, and be friends with them again, but not the big things, not the huge things, not people who really do wrong and evil, not those people, Jesus, right? And sadly, that's been the church's main way, I think, of looking at these words of Jesus for way too long, especially as it's gone to love your enemies. I think at least the institutional church as far too long acted as if, well, that's just nice sentiment, but that's not how we're actually going to live. We as the body of Christ have not always been good at following these words of loving our enemies, forgiving those who have hurt us and blessing those who persecute us. Instead, the church has a very long history of actually casting enemies away, locking them up or even burning them at the stake. And the simple reason for that is that we have not trusted in Christ's words. We have not truly believed in the power of God 
We haven't truly trusted that this message of reconciliation and grace and love can be the possibility Christ says it can be. We don't truly believe that this third way of reconciliation, love, and grace are possible because we doubt ourselves. And maybe at times we doubt the power of God. And what Jesus is saying to us this day is trust in God's power. Trust in God's grace. Trust that God can do in you what seems absolutely impossible, to do what is so strange and different than all the ways of the world. What gives me hope and trust this day is that even if the institutional, the big church, hasn't always lived these words out, there has always been, there has always been a group of people of faith who have believed in these words, who have lived them out, who have passed them down from generation to generation and said, we do believe in the kingdom of God. We do believe in this way of peace and love and reconciliation. And we want to invite you to join us in it. I think of John and Hildegard being big figures with that. But I think of well as well of as Archbishop Desmond Tutu, whose hymn we sung just a little bit ago. I think of his work in the mid-1990s, not only his work in the 70s and 80s, working for justice and human rights and dignity of people who were Black and colored in South Africa, but then facing what to do when there was some, re- some freedom, when there was a chance for justice, and facing a big crossroads. Are we going to pay back all that we've received? Because it was a lot that was given. There was a lot of violence, a lot of bloodshed. Houses were stolen. Children went hungry. Schools were closed. Family members were beaten. There's even stories of men having tires set on fire and thrown over their necks just as a show of power. Are we going to do the same back to those who had hurt us? Or was there going to be another way? And so Desmond Tutu started up a truth and reconciliation hearing. For each day, for I think a couple years, he would have those who had terrible atrocities and injustices done to them come to this committee, come very often not alone, but actually with those who had done the attack, those who had done the harm. And together they would share the truth. They would share what had happened. And at the time of confession, instead of violence or harm being done back as much as it could have been deserved, instead, at the end of the day, each one offered forgiveness and grace to those who had done them such harm. That seems so amazing that that happened. I don't know any other nation or any other time or place where that's happened on such a big scale. And I don't know what South Africa would be right now if it wasn't if it would have simply been a place where either one group was kicked out or or fled or destroyed, if it went back to being apartheid again soon afterwards out of fear and violence. I think so much of that hard work, forgiveness and grace each day. And it wasn't as if Tutu was a man who had limitless strength all on his own. He shares that each day he had to fight back his own tears. He had to fight back He had to to find the courage each day to be there at the hearing, that it wasn't easy for him hearing these stories day after day after day. One day during these years, Bono, the the lead singer of U2, came to visit him in South Africa. He wanted to see what was happening there, and he asked Desmond Tutu one day, how do you do this? How is it possible? How do you find the time and energy and strength? And what Tutu said back to him was prayer. His prayer was the only thing that allowed him to do this, it was knowing it wasn't just his strength, but God's strength that would allow him to keep doing this work, this work that he knew was holy and good and part of Christ's kingdom. In a less famous way or newsworthy way, I got to see this third way of Jesus Christ's grace and reconciliation firsthand. The church I served as a young adult volunteer in Northern Ireland had been burned down in 2002 by a sectarian arson attack. I was there a few years later, but I heard the story many times by church members and community members. After the church was burned down in 2002, all that was left was the front brick facade and everything else as you walked in was ash and rubble. 
And wouldn't you imagine for a second this place, that all we would have is that opening door and everything else as you came in was ash and rubble. I can't imagine the grief, the loss, the pain, the heartache. Also, maybe the desire to seek vengeance, desire to seek out who did this and how can we pay them back? I'm sure that was there for this church in North Belfast as well. But guided by their pastor, Reverend Liz Hughes, and guided by their faith, they responded in a different way. A week after their church was burned down, there was rumors started in the community that a Catholic family that lived right across the street from the church had been a part of the fire. And there was rumors, especially their eldest son, who was about 20 years old, had been a part of the, the group who had set fire to the church that night. Now, they could have gone over and demanded something from that family or attacked or simply kept them at arm's length. But a couple of days after those rumors started, they found out that that family itself started to be attacked by people who thought they were protecting the church and the community started attacking that family. And so the very next morning, Reverend Liz Hughes got together some elders and deacons and leaders of the church, and they met at the church ground still full of ash and rubble, and they said a prayer with one another. And then carrying over food and hot meals and gifts, they walked to their neighbors across the street. They knocked on the door, and they said to those neighbors, whatever has happened, whatever you may or may not have done, you are our neighbors. You are people we love, and we are here for you. They sat down with the family, held their hands, I think cried all with one another, gave hugs, and continued to meet and pray with that family for the weeks and months to come. I don't know how they found that strength, but I think only through the gift of the Holy Spirit, only through God's love, only through knowledge that they weren't alone in that big task. My hope for us today as we hear these daunting and impossible sounding words of Jesus is to believe that they can be true in our world today to believe that our world can be full of reconciliation and love and forgiveness as big and dangerous and scary and hard as it may seem. And that can start with us taking a small step of reaching out. We don't need to be like John and Hildegard. We don't have to be Archbishop Desmond Tutu. We don't even need to be like that church in Northern Ireland. It can simply be us. I'm sure all of us know people in our own lives who maybe who have hurt us or done things, or maybe there's there's some family members or relatives who maybe we haven't talked to in a while because there was something said or done in the past. Something's nudging at us from the spirit saying, maybe it's up to me to take that first step to reach out. Maybe there's someone at work or maybe even in the church that we have a big argument with over. Maybe the Spirit is nudging us to consider, have you thought about things from their point of view? Have you ever put yourself in their shoes? And Maybe you can go from there. Maybe there's people of different political or social views or from different background than you that you've never connected with, that you've kept at arm's length and said, well, I don't hang out with people of that group. And maybe today the Spirit is inviting you to say and to see them as Christ sees them. As people, we are called to love and welcome and be a part of, even if we strongly disagree. How might our world look different if we practice this third way of Christ, this way of reconciliation and grace and truth and love? I know it seems so daunting, but today we know we're not alone. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the power of Jesus Christ. And we have the fellowship of this whole church to guide us and lead us forward. May we hear these words of Christ this day. And may we seek to live them out in our lives and in our world. Amen.